Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, what I want to tell you about is bubbles. Well, you know that already. We produced some bubbles before. I'm happy that now I'm in a room full of experts on bubbles. So I feel uh, ah, more satisfied. Um, but what I want you to do now is uh, to think about these two lines. So I work in the at the National Physical Laboratory. The National Physical Laboratory is a place where we do measurements, precise measurements. So if I told you that I measure bubbles, what are you thinking about? <laughs> well, that's what normally people think about. So a soap bubble, which is a round object with a lot of colors, and is used to play. That, instead, is what I think about, uh, which is a lot of stuff for our world. And the reason for that is that bubbles are everywhere. So tonight, I'll try to tell you some of the stories from our world which, uh, where bubbles have a key role, a role we usually we don't know about. Now, my first story is about strange bubbles. And you might read there, is the shape always round? Well, like in many things, we will try with an experiment. So what I have here is some metallic wire in the shape of a cube and some, well, soapy water. So what I do is I put it in, and then I put it in again. What I get is a cubic bubble. Now, I could try with something else. Let's see what comes out with a triangle. So I put it in, and then in again. What I get is, you might guess, at this point, triangular bubble. So what will I get if I use this instead? Well, I put it in. You know that already. And what I get is a spiral bubble. So this means that, as you might see on the screen in a few seconds, there are many ways to do bubbles of different sizes, of different shapes. But why is it important to study them? Well, these are small animals that you might find in the sea, in the plankton. They've been there for six million years, much more than we humans have been on Earth. And, well, can you see there on the right? Can you see that their skeletons just look like the shapes that I've been using here? So what they do, in a way, is that they grow like bubbles on a structure. And the story goes in interestingly on this. A bubble is round because that's the shape which costs less energy to take. So we had already one talk about energy. We'll hear another one later. And bubbles have a lesson for us. Save your energy. But this also means that if I spend some energy to give them a shape, I can do a lot of stuff with bubbles. And facing the future, you might think about fashion. So the one on the left is a Victorian age dress. You have a structure, you have fabric, and the fabric on top of that is just like a bubble. What about the, the other one? Well, I have, we, we learned earlier tonight that we have probably 80% of girls in this room. And well, I'm sure that you know very well and much better than me what a bubble hem is. But if you think about it, it's just a round skirt with some fabric in it, which pulls it apart, so it works like a bubble. And then you can push it forward and do what Lady Gaga is doing in that picture and wear bubbles. But then, of course, you can take it even further. So if we look at the Guinness World Record, the Guinness World Record of putting people in a bubble is 181 people, which is a lot. It's a very recent record, and it keeps changing. Uh, mid-2012, mid it was 50 people. Right, so why do we study such large bubbles? Well, uh, if you think about science fiction, most of the cities in science fiction books 
have the shape of a bubble. Now, there you see uh, a picture from Star Wars the first, then you see something from uh, the movie of The Simpsons, and you see also something that NASA was looking at in 2003. So if one day we will reach Mars, then probably we will live in a bubble and we will have greenhouses like that one. But then, if we are one day, as I hope, as the future for the humanity, we reach the stars, what will we find there? Well, of course, bubbles. And uh, these are pictures uh, from, uh, well, from different sources, and all of them just look like bubbles. Because bubbles in space are where stars are born. And if you think about it in a different way, stars, so what do you need to make of bubbles? You need, well, a surface, you need air inside and something else outside. Well, that could be a star, couldn't it? So some of the stars from people like me are seen like bubbles. But well, I've been talking enough, and as Willy Wonka says in this, uh, there are bubbles everywhere, but we haven't talked about anything real or something which touches our food. And in fact, the next step is talking about food. So my next demonstration is to show you that marshmallows contain bubbles. So what I have here is a bottle, and one of those, this is one of the cups that you use to preserve uh, the wine. What we do is we extract the air from the bottle. Like that, look at the marshmallows. And then, to show you that I'm not cheating, I put the air back. And you can see that it goes down. Now, what happened there is that the bubbles inside the marshmallows felt the change of pressure outside, felt the change of surroundings around them, and they changed, just like we all do as humans. But this has two big lessons for us. One is, if you go on top of a mountain, don't buy marshmallows, because they will shrink when you, uh, when you go down. Um, and the second one, a lot of the food around us contain bubbles. And think about bread. You put yeast in it to make bubbles, and you want them on the right side. And if you think about the chocolate with bubbles, there must be a right side for the, for the bubbles inside it to be nice, to be nicer. And tonight we will taste a lot of chocolate. I wonder if there are bubbles in them. And there is another study which says, uh, a French study actually, which shows that 30% of the taste of champagne depends on bubbles. That's 30%. That's a lot. Did you think about that? Well, I didn't. And that's why I started the study bubbles. Well, but my favorite one is cheese. Look at that, that's Swiss cheese. That's a, some hair with something around. A bubble, again. But then, you have to be quite careful when you work with bubbles. <laughs> because this can, be ter can turn into something quite difficult. Now, um, I would ask for a volunteer to open this, but probably you won't do that for me. Neither would I. So when I was uh, younger, I used to go hiking on mountains, and I had one of those in my backpack. And so I went up the mountain, up the mountain, and then I reached the top, and you know what's happening there. And then I learned that with a bit of technology, you can do, you can control your bubbles. Which is, I'd be trying tonight. But as we heard, that's a scientific experiment. So sometimes it works, most of the time it doesn't. So if you do it at home, Make sure that you are tapping all around the place, especially the bottom. And now, I need some health and safety equipment. <laughs> and then we try. Not bad. So what I did for you, so let's go back to normal. What I did for you was I controlled the bubbles in there. And what did I use? I used something which is vibration. So what did I do? I pushed the bubble back into the solution. So in some way, I used vibration or movement or energy, if you like, to favor a chemical reaction, which is the bubble going back into the liquid. And I could do that because I knew where the bubbles are. So controlling bubbles, one day, will allow us to have all those food before, might be tasting different. Not something new. I read once um, in, on the internet that this was one of the first jobs by Lady Margaret Thatcher. She was asked to put uh, gas into jellies 
to make them lighter. But the point is, the customer needs to perceive the jellies as the same. So controlling bubbles might make our food taste different, but we have to make sure that this works the right way. So we are doing some studies on honey at the moment, and one day you might find honey where the bubbles are slightly different. But let's go on. Right. So I work at the acoustic laboratory, at the acoustic department of the MPL. So there must be something about sound which I want to tell you tonight. Well, let's do an exercise together, shall we? So imagine yourself walking along the beach. It's a sunny day. It's nice. Ah, warm. I love that. Yes. What's the sound you are hearing? So can you do that for me, all of you? So? Oh, wow. I'm really impressed. Well, did you know that 90% of the sound that you just made comes from bubbles? This sound here is coming from small, tiny bubbles which are expanding and collapsing, getting bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. And this is important because in this measuring the bubbles which are in the sea is a way to measure the, how the sea is healthy. But it's also a way to measure one of the most important parameters in global warming method. So you listen to the bubbles, you might be on a very sunny beach, and you're measuring global war warming. How difficult the science is, isn't it? But then the other thing you can do with that is if bubbles have a sound, you can exploit it and do a bubble organ, like the one which I hope we will see in a minute. No, not very much. Yes. And there is a movie there, which I hope will start. So you can hear that one, and then this one. It's got a slightly smaller nozzle, it's slightly higher pitch. And then the smallest of them makes the highest noise. So that's loads of little different types of bubbles, and it makes a fantastic noise when I stop. And now all of them together. So my colleagues say that with an organ like that, you, they can play Mary at the Little Lamb, which we all know is an important part of, of our musical culture. Uh, so what's there to learn for science? Well, if bubbles have a sound, well, let's explain that. So imagine you have a glass, a very nice glass, and you ping it. So depending on how good the glass is, you have a different sound. And so you can actually, if you knew your bubbles very well, then you could actually uh, use them to give a sound about their surroundings. Because if you get a glass and put it into water or put in something else, or you use a different glass, they respond in a different way. So if you study and know your bubbles very well, what you can do is you can transform them into sensors. And what we want to do here at, MP at MPL is actually measure bubbles precisely. You know that. Did you expect that, didn't you? Well, the, what we is we keep them in cages, just like this one. But in, in this time, they are made of light. Can you imagine holding things with light? Well, that's what we do. So uh, what you see, the, the movie there at the bottom, or the picture in this case, is a bubble which is held by light. And now imagine you could know your bubbles so well, so well, that you know how they ring, and you could interrogate them and ask them everything about what's around them. What's the pressure is? Uh, whether in water there is some pollutant? Whether your bread is ready? Whether a biscuit is a biscuit or a cake? <laughs> and all of this comes from the fact that the bubbles get bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. That's doing aerobic, isn't it? Well, like in any aerobic class, you may have a good teacher which makes you doing aerobic. Well, that's needed for me, I must, I must tell you. Um, and a good, a good aerobic teacher could be a variation of pressure, like that. Uh, so a sinusoidal, a periodical variation of pressure, which could be sound, because sound is something like that, pressure which changes. 
Now imagine the marshmallows here that we had before. Now imagine that I was changing the pressure continuously. What would happen to the bubbles there? Up and down, up and down. And they would produce the sound. Now this phenomenon is called cavitation. Cavitation is actually the creation of bubbles in a liquid due to a change of pressure. But I called this process uh, cavitation because I meant in a larger sense. But what's important there is what happens when the bubble collapses. And to show you what happens, we'll go to see how to exploit this. So, first of all, we go to Mother Nature. We go to the bottom of the sea where lives a nice, interesting shrimp called the piston shrimp. Now, this shrimp is a very interesting one. Again, there is a movie he plays on other shrimps. What he does, he has a big claw that he prepares, and then, stop! And you see the effect, did you do that? And tap, and again. So he snaps, and we look at it in slow motion. So here is prepared, and while snapping, a bubble is formed. And this bubble stuns the prey. But now, okay, did you see the flash of light? Well, where there is light, normally there is a, a very high temperature. In this particular case, we are using a thermal camera, like the ones that you have seen here. So the temperature is not so high. But still, in that bubble, someone has measured the temperature as high as 200 degrees, which is something of the order of our ironing systems. Well, this means that not only this shrimp snaps and lunch is served, but also it doesn't like sushi. <laughs> now, if you could hear a lot of shrimps like that, snapping, so can we do that? Can we all snap? And now, let's do it this way. First you, first you on this side. Now you. Well, these are the shrimps. Did you hear this sound before, earlier tonight? Well, it's a bit like the sound of the sea. So again, uh, we said before that the sound of the sea comes from bubbles. But does it come from shrimps? <laughs> well, this, in that case, the shrimp wanted cavitation. But sometimes you don't want it. And that's how you get destroyed propellers. So what you want to do is actually to measure cavitation. Measure it so well that you know what's happening. That's what we do. And I have a very few seconds for discussing this. So I'll try to go quick. Uh, well. OK, so we have a movie there, which I hope will start. Well, anyway, um, in, our, in many of our of the pumps, of our washing machines, what happens is that they turn and they produce bubbles which were not expected. And this consumes energy, a lot of energy. Someone has given me a, a number, which is 60% of the energy that is lost is due to unwanted bubbles. So, but you can also want the bubbles. And they are used, for instance, to destroy the kidney stones because the bubbles are there, they are produced by sound, and they erode the kidney stone until it's completely destroyed. Or you can use them to clean very well uh, Formula One engines. Or you can use to clean my glasses before they put the anti-reflex coating. And all of this is done with bubbles, bubbles which are created and do this. And they are also used by dentists to uh, sterilize surgical tools. But also, they can be used to facilitate reactions, like the bubbles going back in the coke or in the, in the liquid, as we did before. So if you can control, if you can distinguish between good and bad, that's a measurement you need. That's why it's important to measure bubbles. And if you can measure bubbles, you can do the dream. Now, in many hospitals already in the UK, bubbles are used as contrast. Now, there is um, the, the number that you see there on the right are an extrapolation from statistics. So if you count the number of people who are screened as a suspect of cancer nowadays in the UK, there is one every five minutes. That's a lot. And what they do, they get an ultrasound scan. Ultrasound is something which is used for almost everything nowadays in medical uses. What they do is, well, the doctor does a test like that and then asks, 
for an additional uh, check because they want to be sure of the diagnosis. But this costs time. This costs money. And that's, but there is a study which has shown that if you use bubbles to enhance the contrast, then the efficiency of ultrasound can jump. So to 90%, starting from 60%, that's a lot. And again, this will probably allow, knowing the bubbles, will allow us to have um, a better way, an earlier way to detect cancer. But also, if we can do it, we will allow us to have a new form of chemotherapy, where you put the drug on the bubble, and you use the power that you pass to the bubble, the amplification, so you put the bubbles in the blood, and they're covered so they do not get big. And then suddenly, when you reach the bad guy, you use them to destroy it. Potentially no side effects, but you need to measure your bubbles right. That's what I do. So bubbles are everywhere. Thank you for your attention. I went over my time. And they affect our life in ways we don't expect. And now that we are here, facing the future, maybe they will change our lives. They will make them better. That's why it's so important to study them. That's why it's so important to go, to start from the play that we did before, creating bubbles, and look more around you, into the soup that we have tonight, into the quiche, into some of the shoes that you're wearing, into some of the carpets. There are bubbles there, everywhere. Thank you for your attention.